Hey, this is Matt. Once again, what about 10 of the videos? Another paid request. It's time for Mozzie. Thank you so much for that. And for those interested in requesting any type of videos or topics, reactions, commentaries, reviews, re reviews, what have you, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both things are down below in the info box. And this is for the 1987 film Angel Heart, which you got the DVD here. Which. It seems like, I mean, I know it says selected scene time to ever make you work, but even the interview, it seemed like he was disinterested in talking about the film or wasn't that proud of the film, which I don't understand. And I didn't give a shit about these documentaries on voodoo. Really did not care at all. So, after you get the original director commentary and stuff, but. Uh, for special edition, I still felt it was a bit lacking. Maybe they did the best they could with it, but... Angel Heart came out in 1987. It was released by Terracol, who at that point released what, Ramble for Split Part 2, Ramble 3, or would release Total Recall. I think they had a hand in releasing Terminator 2, Universal Soldier, until ultimately, sadly, they went belly up in the early 90s, and I think... Cutthroat Island was the last, or one of the last films they released. And it's directed by Alan Parker. Alan Parker, who... I think a year after... He would do Mississippi Burning. Which I reviewed recently, and... Do liked that film. He had also done Pink Floyd's The Wall. Another film I do enjoy. And the film starts Mickey Rourke and Robert De Niro. You also have Lisa Bonet, who at the time was on the Cosby Show. The plot of film, it's in 1955, and Mickey Ward is Harry Angel, a private investigator who's hired by this guy named Lewis, played by Robert De Niro, to find this singer called Johnny Favorite. And the last time he was seen is sometime in the 1940s. And so he, Mickey Rourke goes on this investigation to find out what's going on, find out information, and it takes it from New York to New Orleans, and a lot of people he's talking to, they end up dead. So he's trying to figure out, like, why is he being framed, what's going on here in Louisiana, and ultimately finding the truth, so to speak. Now, this is one of those films that I do like. I do enjoy the film. I think it's a pretty solid psychological study of a man who is running from his guilt that even he doesn't know he has. Running from his past sin and his past sin catching up with him. And how the hell do I do this without spoiling the ending? I think most people who watch this review, they know the ending. I would say this. I think Mickey Ward gives a wonderful performance. I actually think it's one of his best performances he gave was in this movie. And Mickey Ward, it's a sad thing. At this time, he was such a great up-and-coming actor. This is a guy that he would... He was in that film with Michael Cimino directing. And, you know, people looked at him as, like, the next Robert De Niro, the next Al Pacino. I think if it wasn't for his ego, for his violent tendencies towards directors or people in the business, and not trying to play ball a little bit more, and also picking a project. I think if he lessened the ego, was a bit more open-minded to stuff, his career could have flourished just like De Niro and Pacino's did. I mean, even in the 90s, you look at Pacino and De Niro, you know, they both did Heat, and Pacino was in Any Given Sunday, and De Niro was in Ronin, and Jackie Brown, and T. Fear. Pacino won an Oscar for Sin of a Woman. Mickey Rourke, when he got in the 90s, I mean, he was, what, 
Harley Davidson, the Marlboro Man, which I don't mind, but I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's a classic. I don't mind the film, but I wouldn't say I love the movie. And then whether it be his days of boxing or just pissing people off or just ostracizing people, he fucked up his own career. Sally. And then he had a little bit of resurgence around the time of Sin City. And then he got, what, uh, he was in The Expendables in 2010. He was in Iron Man 2, The Wrestler. Great movie. And he didn't learn anything because he did it yet again. Because I know, like, Quentin Tarantino wanted him for the bad guy in Death Proof. I want Mickey work as the bad guy in Death Proof. And his agent... Oh, you know, he, uh, he needs this, he needs that. And Mickey Ward should have taken more control of that agent. And if you were, if you were more gung-ho about it, be like, okay, you know what? Let me take care of this. But no, I, I think he fucked up yet again. And then started doing shit like, uh, you know, directed video films with Megan Fox and uh, these other movies. And it just, it's a shame. His face got screwed up and he looks melted now. Like someone took a heat lamp and melted his face. His acting is really, ah, I can't remember the last film I saw him in. It's just too bad. It just, again, if you have learned a little bit more humble pie to eat, you should have had a big series of films, even in the 90s, with like De Niro and Pacino, but Sally wasn't the case. But he's very talented, and like I said, it's one of my favorite performances of his. Barbara De Niro appears from time to time. You two gather who he is fairly quickly it's kind of one of those of you know I think I think people that have seen a lot of movies they don't figure out the twist fairly quickly but I still thought it was a nicely done twist and Robert De Niro is definitely having a bit of fun if you understand his look he based it on Martin Scorsese if that's the case that's pretty damn hilarious and this definitely has a mood and atmosphere to it. I think that's what really appealed to me about it. It's not just Mickey Ward's performance, but the mood and atmosphere to this film was absolutely on point. Kind of the mood and atmosphere you would see in like a Silent Hill movie or a few years later in Jacob's Ladder. This feeling of doom and things are not probably going to end that well more than likely and the the way the locations were shot the open scene in New York where you have a cat and a dog fighting each other and then lo and behold the dog comes across a dead body and it's just how it was in, in New York and the dog runs off and you know, this poor schmo's there and has nothing to do with the rest of the movie but it just shows you know this oppressive feeling of this world we're in and the score I, I huge credit to the score Trevor Jones the composer who would later on do Cliffhanger which I love that score but just the, the way utilizing the heart beating and a bit of that saxophone blues uh, with the Louisiana sequences but again just this dour mood that you know something is that could be that much of a happy ending so to speak now granted the investigation is kind of is film noir mixed in with a bit of the supernatural horror And sure, there there are films that probably did that a bit better. It's a different type of film, but like the first power, Lou Diamond Phillips is more of my cup of tea. 
And yeah, it's more of the style and the performances I like. Because the plot itself is pretty much go to this person, ask questions, come back, they're dead. Go to this person, ask questions, come back, they're dead. Go to this person, ask questions, come back, they're dead. Kind of runs and repeat. So it's kind of spinning on his wheels. So I wouldn't say it's the most exciting or that part was the most intriguing part of the, the, the movie for me. So it was less about that that I liked and more about the psychological status of our lead character. And I have to get into spoilers. So you're trying to find out that the guy he's looking for is himself. Just back in the day, Johnny Favorite, in order to get fame and stardom, he and some others took this soldier, made a sacrifice, took and ate his heart out in order to steal his soul because Johnny Favorite had made a deal with the devil. And he got stardom. In order to cheat the deal, I'm going to steal this person's soul. So then the devil can't find me. And I couldn't find him for like 12 years. But after stealing the guy's soul, as a soldier was drafted, got amnesia, and uh, became and was Harry Angel. And then you come to find out that they they say guided by Robert De Niro is the devil, Louis Cipher, Lucifer, which I know the the name is very much on the nose, but even Mickey Ward kind of says that he even makes fun of it. even your name, you know, I'm not going to take seriously. He pretty much says that at the end. And it's one of those things where, on one end, he's getting what he deserves. You don't burn for this. But at the same time, there's a, there's a great tragedy to it. And I know, usually it doesn't seem like I, I'd be up for this type of movie. But I think it's just very well done with Mickey Ward's performance. And I disagree. Like, I know a friend of mine, Michael OCB, he said the film didn't have heart. I disagree, because I did enjoy Mickey Ward's character, just for his demeanor. How he's like this nice guy who's easy going, and I like some of his lines of dialogue. It's Wednesday. You know what that means? Anything can happen today. That means that anything can happen today. Is there something about the way he said that? Almost a sense of he knows something is going on, he knows something deep down is wrong, and these boys that he's looking at himself. And earlier we see his full face, but later on we see like a cracked mirror he's looking at. And just this guy that pretty much the gist of the plot is the devil knows who he is and just continually, continually fucking with him and torturing him. Where you don't go over here, I know what's going to happen, which is... Your amnesia angel persona is nice and easy going and cool. I just say maybe that piece of the soul, however you want to put it. But the Johnny Favorite, the repressed part, it's going to come out and kill these people and you're not going to remember it. So he's the one killing these people, but he doesn't remember it. And you tell details of that too. And it doesn't cheat as well. It's like the movie doesn't cheat. Like, there's a bit where he sees a person, and he leaves, and then that's where you see, like, all this blood on him. And you're like, why has he got blood all over his shirt? Like, when he was with the guy, he was kind of just slapping him around, but now he's got all his shirt, this blood on his shirt, he's got a scalpel. So he was talking to the guitar guy, uh, Toots. And you hear this heart pounding. And also, like, when... Things start to happen. You have this fan, and this motif of the fan will spin when it seems like Johnny Favors' persona will rise up. It is the way Alan Parker directed with the style, the lighting, the mood, Trevor Jones' score with the heartbeat sound as part of it uh, is 
fairly effective. Now there's some moments I'm going like earlier on like after like the first person he tossed to or so he's looking at this kind of a church and there's a woman sitting there and he's walking up and these two people just randomly beat the shit out of him. I don't know why those two are beating the shit out of him and throwing Mickey Ward in these chairs. I don't know who those two people were and why they were doing it to Mickey Ward. I don't know why. I don't know if that was ever explained. If so, I missed it. I apologize. But it's like, who the fuck are these guys? I know later on, there are people that work with this person that was killed. But I mean, this is like... That's later on. I'm talking about the one earlier on where... I just think maybe they figure, well, we need some action in here. So here you go. Also, at the time, there's this big thing about the sex scene and oh my god it's the horrific sex scene and and blah 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 and there's blood on it and it was much ado about nothing i think that the way it's edited and you do see a bit of blood but the way it was edited i think it was a bunch of hoopla that wasn't that bit of a deal especially compared to today's age There's a bit where you, for two characters, they put these yellow contact lenses in that's meant to be scary. It wasn't. It came off as a bit laughable, especially the second time they do it. I, I don't think they needed that. I think that looked a bit hokey. But yeah, it's a nice... I would say Jacob's Ladder I enjoy much, much more than this. But it's a nice descent into the psychological state of Mickey Ward's character of his past sense catching up to him. I would say, you know how some of those later Hellraiser films try to do that? Like Hellraiser and Inferno and there's another movie... Whereas like, your past has come up to bite you on the ass. This this is like a much better version of what those films tried to do. This is a much better version of that. And Mickey Ward, I, he, it was heartbreaking, his performance. I think that really caught me because on one hand, the person he was was such a vile piece of shit that he didn't kill this innocent soldier and did all this horrible stuff. But at the same time, the person he is now who doesn't remember that just, you know, like, finds the dog tags, spoilers with his name on it. I know who I am. I know who I am. And the way he's trying to talk to Robert De Niro and you're trying to frame me. Just, you know, but Sally is a character that's just living on borrowed time. And his past sins now come to come to fruition and even the line when Lisa Bonet is found dead and the cops are there and like you don't burn angel and just this defeated look on his face is like yeah in hell and that could come off as like a clunky line but Mitchell Ward with his tear-stained face, sold it so well. I like the way the end credits are done, too, was this elevator ride, and you get the idea that it's his elevator ride to hell. And what's going to happen after that's opened? Your mind will wander as you leave the, the movie. But before that, like, Robert De Niro, it's like, your soul's mine. Like, what, your Shane son? He's got like the yellow eyes. That looked ridiculous. And then uh, Lisa Bonet, she, you kind of find out that Lisa Bonet's character was the daughter of Johnny Favorite. So uh, without Mickey Ward realizing, he fucked his own daughter without him realizing. And now she's dead because his repressed version killed her. And then there's a baby, and I guess that's the baby of Robert De Niro's character, 
because earlier she described like how the baby came to be and you get the idea it was the devil and then the baby has these yellow eyes staring at him I know that's supposed to be creepy but I laugh my ass off and why was that even needed like why did he even need that she had a baby and the baby's with the devil just nothing really comes of that other than that one silly shot is that why is that the only reason they brought that up is okay yeah she has this baby the baby's from the devil and the only reason we have is to have that one shot that I thought is the silliest shot in the movie because the baby with the other... it, it looked fucking ridiculous it, it looked stupid I wish should have cut all that shit out with the baby it, it wasn't needed to me it, it it, the impact of the finale was brought down a little bit because of that silly shit. But I think if you just had Mickey Rourke and his performance. Like even then I would just cut it. Like we have the baby here. He looks. And just have the baby look normal. Like he realizes that's his grandkid. Or he thinks it is. Oh hell, I think that would be more effective. That would be more effective if he just realized this was his daughter and she's dead from his repressed stuff and he's tear stained and that's his grandson. You don't burn for this. Look at the innocent baby and who he's found out who he is. Now this fate that he led himself on earlier in the film. It's not a you know a film I rewatch a lot, but I do think it's effective in what it was trying to do. This is what the Ninth Gate thought it wanted to be, like with Johnny Depp. The Ninth Gate, the Ninth Gate, and I say it because it's much of kind of detective, or he was a detective. He was looking for books, but it's kind of this investigation mixed in with supernatural. I like this a lot better than the Ninth Gate. I thought it was much more effective in its mood and atmosphere. I didn't... The investigation wasn't most exciting. I, I guess you could say that's supposed to be second nature to... What's going on with your Ward's character. I didn't understand that, but... Maybe if there was some red herrings... That make the investigation into a little bit more... And it's kind of these red herrings that he wants to blame on this person... And wants to blame this other person, but then ultimately, no, it's, that's not the case. But overall, I thought it was an effective movie. So, with that said, thanks for watching. Take care. We'll see you guys later. Bye bye.